wait. Now we wait to see if someone comes in. This is the most precarious position to be in. So let's see. Do people show up? Or am I hanging myself out to dry? Are they going to be here? Or is it me by myself? I don't know. So far, we got nobody. Just me. One watching. Only me. Yo! Zach, first one in the chat. Third eye fine. Shout out to Zach. He's got some nice videos on his channel. Check them out. All right. We made it. We made it. We made it. We made it. Very good. All right. How's everyone doing? No, I, I, I believe people are going to show up. I don't believe that I'm going to do it the right way. So I'm still new at this. So I don't know, like, if I press the wrong button. I'm just sitting in here showing up, talking to myself. But I know if I do it right, a couple of fine folks will come. So I do appreciate all of you guys that do take the time and come and hang out on Wednesday night. We're starting to develop some sort of routine now. A couple Wednesdays in a row, 8 p.m. Eastern. We will be here always to answer some questions, help people out, have some fun, learn a couple of things. Where's everybody from today? I am from sunny South Florida, and it is 65 degrees here today. And I'm going to be honest with you, it was pretty cold today. I know you guys are not going to like it. But it was pretty cold today. So where are you guys from and how cold is it where you guys are out? Um, oh, we got Noelle in the chat. Shout out, Noelle. I appreciate her for being here, helping out. All right, first question from Don. I know this is titled The Best eBay Reselling Hacks. We're going to get the best hack out of the way right from the jump. Wake up in the morning. Put on your clothes. Go put your shoes on. And then go to work. That is the best eBay hack for the year 2024. Try it. Wake up, put on your clothes, put on your shoes, and then do your work. That's it. That is the best eBay hack that anybody can give to you. So we got the first question from Don. I know you suggest to look at what sold to do research, and I know how to look for specific items, but how do I look to see generally what is selling? All right, so for more general results, you're going to want to have more general searches. So let's say for sweaters, you would search sweater. I always like to go in left-hand navigation like we talk about and kind of narrow it down to a price range of items that are usually found at the thrift. We're not usually going to find $500 items at the thrift, so to spend a bunch of time learning about it, having that our focus um, is a little bit difficult. So I think that really try to narrow it down. Um in the range where we will actually find something, usually $30, $50, $60 range, and then concentrate on those items. And you want to start seeing the patterns, um, specific brands, specific styles, specific keywords, open up a new chat, and then really drill down on those keywords, really drill down on those brands, and then try to retain as much as that as possible. So something that I was talking about the other day on the calls when Oh, I actually did. Um, I did a podcast with Desiree from the Jewelry Call, and I think that's going to go on next Wednesday on her channel. Um, she's starting a great little podcast, and it's and it's about jewelry. And for a couple of weeks, I hosted the Jewelry Call, and she wanted to kind of get get like my idea of how to study and learn new things. And when I hosted the call, we talked about some Czech jewelry, some Bohemian jewelry. We talked about Niger Brothers. Um, when, when I was researching, I saw satin glass, I saw rondelles, um, and I saw a bunch of different things that I didn't know what it was. And every single time that I find something that I don't know what it is, even if I'm driving, I'll pull over and I'll Google it. So I, I know exactly what we're talking about. So for rondelles, I didn't know what rondelles were. And like I told Desiree on the chat, the only rondelle that I know is Rondell White, who was the center fielder of the Florida Marlins in the 1997 World Series. That is the only rondelle that I know. But apparently rondelles are on jewelry. They're spacers. And now I know. Um, so whenever I don't know something, I Google it. And whenever I don't know a style, don't know a term, gusset. Once upon a time, I didn't know what gusset was. I stopped what I was doing. I Googled it. I got the definition for gusset. And then I open up another tab for images. And then I look at images of gusset. And then by learning the definition, 
learning the image that gets embedded in the mind and then I don't forget it. So I think that that's the best way to research is be is be curious. And then whenever you don't know something, stop, Google the definition and then look at Google images. And I did that right before we started this call because it is titled the best eBay reselling hacks. And I wanted clarity on the word hack. So I Googled it. A hack is a strategy or technique for managing one's time or activities more efficiently. But the clarity comes from the, the sentence that they use as an example. There's one easy hack to avoid the $8 popcorn trap. Eat before you get in line at the theater. And that directly translates to what we talk about every single day. If you want to have the best results at the thrift, study before you go. Get the knowledge front loaded in your head before you go to the thrift. So if you want the best hack against $8 popcorn, it's eat before you go to the theater. If you want the best hack for finding items at the thrift, it's doing exactly what Don is doing and preloading her information, front loading her information, studying, learning before we go out to the thrift. So if you want the best reselling hack for sourcing, it's doing your work, studying, becoming a better reseller, becoming more proficient, learning tags. One of the websites that we were looking at today and we talk about very often is the Vintage Fashion Guild. If you go to the Vintage Fashion Guild, there are tons and tons and tons of labels on there. And every single brand has a definition and a brief history. Some brands have been sold. Some brands have been acquired. And that's important to know, especially when we're talking about the RN number. We spend a lot of time talking about RN numbers as well. So if you go to the Vintage Fashion Guild, you study all of those brands, you study all of those tags. I promise you that's the best hack in finding stuff at the thrift store. I promise you. Thank you, Don, for the question. Very good. Thank you. We got a lot of people from different places in the house. I appreciate you guys for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. I will answer every single question. Um, does the algorithm give you more views if you sell more items? So um, this would be speculation because eBay doesn't tell you this. Um, but according to the listing quality report, Everything is broken down by category all the way down to the point of if you've received negative or neutral feedback inside of that particular category. So that leads me to believe it's on a category by category basis. And for the ones that do excel in a particular category, eBay would be more incentivized to funnel them traffic because they have more confidence in that seller to provide a good customer experience that's not going to result in a negative or neutral feedback or a return. Whereas if you are getting returns, if you are getting negative and neutral feedbacks, why would eBay be inclined to funnel you traffic? So I think we have an individual grade per category because that's how it's broken down in the listing quality report. And again, this is speculation. And I believe we have a store-wide grade. And our store-wide grade is you know, our defects, our item not as described, everything on the seller metrics page as far as um, your shipping time, your cases closed without seller resolution, your tracking uploaded on time and validated. All of that gives us a score, which is unknown to us. All of that gives you a score where if you can tell eBay you're doing a good job, eBay is way more incentivized into giving you more traffic and more traffic will give you more sales. Where on, on the other side of that, if, if you're late shipping, if you're canceling items for out of stock, if when you do make a sale, um, you know, you print the label and you drop it off a week later. If when you do make a sale, you get a uh, item not as described return or you get a negative or neutral feedback, why would eBay give that person more traffic than somebody that is doing everything that eBay wants? It just doesn't make sense to me logically. So I do believe that if you sell items successfully versus not successfully, eBay will give you more views. And again, we can point towards the different seller levels. We have top rated, we have top rated plus, we have above standard, we have below standard. For anyone that has been in below standard, you know you see a decrease in traffic. So that's eBay telling you, we don't have confidence in what you're doing. So we're going to give confidence to the other levels. And as you keep going up above standard, you get a little bit more traffic. Top rated, you get more traffic. Top rated plus, you're doing everything right. You are, you're doing a great job. Your metrics are good. You know, you're doing everything that you say you're supposed to do on the listing and you're going up and beyond 
by offering a fast shipping one day or sooner, by offering free 30-day returns or 60-day returns, you know, why wouldn't eBay be incentivized for all of this traffic that they pay for, for all of these customers that they acquire for us? Why would they not funnel them to the buyers that are selling more items successfully versus sellers that are not selling items successfully? Um, Nacho Cheese, great name, 10 out of 10. Hey, I want to make content so I can bring traffic to my eBay store, but I'm afraid of my customers seeing my personal address. How can I have a private shipping return address? All right, very good. You can go and get a, a P.O. box. Um, you know, it's a couple bucks per year and you can use that as your, uh, you know, your, your central hub as far as eBay goes. Or if you're going to make contact, that could be your outgoing and your return. Um, for me, I have my warehouse as my central hub. So on eBay, everyone sees the warehouse address for outgoing and returns. Um, but if you don't have a warehouse or a physical location, you can get a P.O. box and that'll be just fine. Good question. Thank you. Very good. Um, is keywords important in the theme column that don't fit in the title? Um, for me personally, I'm going to put them into the title, put them into item specifics. Me personally, I have no experience with, um, I guess, spamming a bunch of keywords in the theme um, column. I have never done that personally, so I can't speak to the effectiveness of it. Um, but I do know that eBay wants pertinent and correct information. And if you do give incorrect information on left-hand navigation or on search, when customers do see that item, they will be less inclined to, to click it. If they're less inclined to click it, then that item will drop in search versus more inclined to, to click it being accurately described. That item will convert better and rise better in search. Um, Keenan said, how do I get on Tuesday, Tuesday night call and the morning call? All right, if you're in the group, drop a post in the group. I'll give you some helpful links, but we do have the pin post right at the top where you are prompted to read the pin post when you enter the group and it has all the information in there. So um, feel free to drop a post or send me a message. I'll get you all set. All right, thank you. We got the questions rolling in. I appreciate it very much. Um... If I want 20 listings a day, how many listings should I be doing per day? Um, I mean, technically speaking, 20, if you had 20 iPhones priced on the market, then you would have 20 sales a day. Um, unfortunately, there's no truck backing up 20 iPhones a day under market for you to get 20 sales a day. So the best way to, I guess, calculate this is you need to see what size store you have now. And just for round numbers, small numbers, just as an example, if you had 100 items and you sold one item a day, for every 100 items, you get one sale. So that means if your store grew to 200 items, you would get two sales. If your store grew to 300 items, you would get three sales. If your store grew to 1,000 items, you would get 10 sales. If your store grew to 2,000 items, you would get 20 sales. Now, again, that is an example. That is not a rule. It is not a rule that... If you have 100 items, you will get one sale. It is not a rule that, that eBay has a 1% sell-through. That is not a rule. It all depends on your product, your offer, and, and what how enticing it is to the buyer. So some people have 500 items in their store, and they get one sale a day. Some people have 1,000 items in their store, they get one sale a day. So for the person that has 1,000 items in their store, they would need 20,000 items to get 20 sales a day. That is the reality for those folks. So you take your store size, you see on average how many sales you get per month, you divide it out and you figure out for how many new items I need to introduce to my store to equate to an additional sale. If it's 150 for an additional sale, you add 150. If it's 123, you add 123. And then you figure out what store size you need to theoretically produce X amount of sales that you're looking for. And this is theoretical because this is based on and forecasted on and counting on you keeping your product and you keeping your product mix exactly the same and nothing changing. So if you had 100 items in your store and you sell one a day, you have 200 items in your store and the next 200 are gold bars, you won't sell two a day. You might sell 101 a day because those extra 100 items of all gold bars, those will sell. 
So this is just forecasting based on nothing changing. So you take your store size, you see how many you sell, how many items in your store does it take to have one sale? And then you can times that by 20 and that's going to give you 20 sales. So if you don't like the number that you see after you run this math, and again, this is just an example. This is just theoretical. It's not realized, but this is kind of like a um, kind of like a guideline that, that you could look at. If you do this math and it's going to say you need 14,000 items to get 20 sales, what do we have to do? We have to get better items. We have to speed up our sell through. We have to make better listings. We have to learn better keywords. We have to make our offers more enticing in order to bring down that X number of items listed equals one sale. Um, Vanessa says, how long do I have to wait for eBay to increase my selling limit? So if you are getting close to the selling limit, you can use the tool online. It should be in seller tools, seller help. And then you can ask for uh, a um, an increase in your seller limit. Um, if that's denied, which a lot of times it is, call eBay, say, hey, I'm doing a great job. I'm having a lot of fun. I love selling on eBay. Look at my metrics. Look at my feedback. All of my customers are happy. Can you increase my selling limits? What can you do to help? And they'll take a look at it. They'll press a couple keys on the keyboard, and then they will increase your selling limit after that. They may ask you a couple of questions like, you know, where are you getting the items from? What kind of items are you selling? Because, you know, they're still trying to figure you out and they want to keep the platform safe. So, you know, you could say from around the house, you could say you're going to garage sales, going to thrift stores, whatever method you are doing to get the items, just be open, honest with them. Um, but the best practice, best bet to having your selling limits increase is just to call them on the phone and talk to them and then and then ask. If you are far away from your selling limit, they're probably not going to increase it. If you're getting up close, you'll probably have much better luck. Fireball Flipper said, you may have answered this before, but how do you feel about AI descriptions on eBay? So me personally, how they sit today, I think that they kind of um, play up the item um, too much for my liking, which increases the risk for a potential item as item not as described. So for that reason, I, I'm just going to write my own description and kind of be the, um, you know, the master of my own destiny rather than letting the AI take over and then edit in the AI or fixing the AI, AI. After you do all that, it just takes more time than to just write your own description. So until the, the AI can, you know, do it accurately where it's not going to increase the risk of an item not as described, it's not for me personally. Jennifer says, I think clothing resellers should check boutiques in person or online, which allows you to not be surprised when you see the brands at the thrift. That's another great tip, too. So, um, you know, every now and then my wife and I, we enjoy Shake Shack and they have a Shake Shack that's kind of outside a mall around here. So we go there every, every, you know, a couple of months. And when we do go there, we go to some of those fancy stores and geez, man, the price at like Saks Fifth Avenue or like off Saks Fifth Avenue like the price that people pay for like brands that we find at the thrift store and sell on eBay for like $20, like at Saks Fifth Avenue, they're like $500 or like $800. It's totally mind blowing. And there's people over there that are buying it at Saks and little do they know they can go on eBay and get it for $20. But yeah, that is a great tip. And just go there and learn the brands, but not only learn the brands, but like Get an idea of where quality stuff is manufactured. Get an idea of what a quality tag looks like. Like a lot of quality tags, especially for women's, are just tacked on the corners. A lot of quality tags are very basic. And, you know, I learned that by going to the mall and going to those fancy stores that I personally have no business in the world being at. But um, I do I do learn a lot of brands there and I do learn a lot of nuance over there as well. Wow. That's a great tip. Yep. Yeah. Um, how do you tell the difference between real vintage and remakes? Um, some of them can be a little bit tough, but a couple of things to look for is you want to learn the tags. So a lot of the fakes um, seem to be on like giant by TJ's tags. And those tags are a little bit wonky and they do have some guides on that. If you go to Google images, if you type in fake vintage giant tag, there are differences in the tag. If you If you also Google fake vintage tags. There's a lot of guides when you go to Google Images. Also, a great resource is Defunct. 
D-E-F-U-N-K-D, no E on it. Defunct has a lot of guides and a lot of resources when it comes to vintage and fake tags. So first and foremost is fake tags. Secondly, the print on them, when you look up close, is going to be pixelated like an old dot matrix printer. And that might be too old of an example for a lot of people. I know Isaiah's in here. Shout out to Isaiah. He just started his own YouTube channel. It's Isaiah underscore TMN. And we had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. He's the young guy who sells shoes, um, doing a great job, um, taking care of his family, just trying to get over that next hump. But he doesn't understand what a dot matrix printer is. He didn't even know who Nirvana was. And that made me feel old. So it looks like a dot matrix printer printed it. So like if you get close up to it, it's all pixelated. It's not smooth. It's not clear. It's not crisp. The screen print is very pixelated. Um, also, the um, the single stitch on it. If, if you're asking this question, I assume you know what single stitch is. The single stitch on the fakes that I've seen in person is not right. And I don't know how to explain that. It's just, if you know what single stitch is, when you see the fake, you'll know, you'll go, oh, this is not right. And when you combine the not right single stitch with the um, the dot matrix printing, um, you know, if you check the tag, also the shirts are, are kind of thin. They, they kind of feel like they're dry rot, but they're not. They're kind of thin. They're not the heavy duty cotton that you would expect from the 90s. They're kind of a little bit thinner. Um, so that that's a giveaway too. So the tag, the... Um, the screen print being pixelated, the single stitch, just trust me, it's just not right. I don't know how to explain it. The single stitch is just not right. And then the weight of the shirt are very good giveaways for that. Mm, very good, thank you. Peter Lopez said, question on the 499 Patreon call, does that tier include these live calls and other group calls? So it does not. However, I do do a live coaching call just for the 499 and it's a great call because that, that's a smaller tier and there's only a couple people that show up you know maybe 10 20 people so a, a lot of attention a lot of focus a lot of time spent and if anyone is in the group you know i answer questions till the cows come home when you guys are done i'm done and that's like a competition that i do because i can't let the chat beat me so um i will go on the 499 tier till the cows come home and all the questions are answered. And we just did that call this past Monday and we had a great group in there and we got a lot done and I gave him some homework and showed him some stuff, showed him how to do the zip code call, talked about title structure. So for those folks, I appreciate them. And that's the best bargain in town right there. So I appreciate them so much. Then I, I I do that call, which I don't even advertise. I just do it for them because they are there. Um, if I have a coupon set, say 20%, then also send out an offer. Is the offer price also including the coupon promo? Great question. And if you were here last week, we answered this question. So who remembers this question from last week? Does anybody remember? Does anyone remember this question from last week? Because we did it last week. Were you guys here? Were you guys paying attention? So this link right here that I gave out last week, bullet number four, coupon does not apply to auction style listings, purchases made through best offer or seller offer features, or any listings in real estate, motor vehicles, or coins and currencies. So the question is pertaining to this portion right here. If I have a coupon and the buyer sends an offer, does the coupon stack on top of best offer? And the answer is no, it does not stack on top of best offer. So if we are going to play the eBay game, we have to know the rules of the eBay game. And that is a very, very important rule. So if you are running a promotion, a markdown promotion of 20% and your item is $10 starting price, you're running a 20% off promotion. The buy it now price is now $8. $10 original price minus 20%, $8 buy it now. If somebody sends you an offer for six, they cannot use your coupon on the $6 offer. If your item is $10 regular price, you have a 20% off sale and now it's $8 and they choose to buy it now at the $8 price, they buy it now, don't send an offer, they buy it now at the $8 price, 
they can use the coupon in that instance. So coupons do not stack on top of best offer. Coupons do stack on top of your markdown promotion so long as they buy it now. Great question, thank you. Beverly said, do you suggest paying extra to promote your listings? They are new to this. So I think that um, all of these promotions, all of these promoted listings, I think these are strategies. There's a difference between a strategy and a business model. If we're using them as a business model, maybe reevaluate the items that we're purchasing. If we're using them as a strategy, that's probably the best bet, the best option for our business in order to maximize profit. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a podcast. It's me sitting there, has red writing on it. Um, it's titled uh, The Problem with Promoted Listings. Definitely check that one out, Beverly, because it's a very, very in-depth um, conversation. Go back a couple of weeks, you'll see it. Um, but should you, or do I suggest, it's really a case-by-case -case basis, and it's going to depend on the item, the desirability of the item, the saturation of the market, and what your business model is. So it, it, it's not a blanket answer. There is no right or wrong way. Some people believe in promoting everything. Some people believe in picking up items that have such a great sell-through that they don't require promoted listings. So I think that the best strategy and the best use of promoted listings is doing it in combination with some sort of aged inventory markdown process or some sort of process where you have assessed your items and you've had them for too long. That is probably a good opportunity to look at maybe increasing promotions in order to get better placement, more eyeballs equal more sales, or running some sort of markdown sale to, again, in entice a buyer to actually purchase the item. If you are buying items that are heavily, heavily saturated, which is fine, you can still build a beautiful business on a heavily saturated item business model. However, it's going to just require probably smaller margins and probably a larger store just due to market saturation, which is fine. You can build a beautiful business on top of it. There's nothing wrong with it. In that instance, be sure to factor in promoted listings into all of your math when it comes to whether you're making a profit or not making a profit. And we went over this in the podcast about three weeks ago, and the thumbnail says techonomics. So that's two great podcasts that you guys should check out if you have questions about promoted listings and if you have questions about your numbers, because there's a lot of people who are promoting themselves out of business because they don't understand really how much eBay is charging them to get that sale. So if you are going to use promoted listings, here, here's my official stance. Do not use promoted listings if you do not know your numbers. And I'll say it again because people half listen. Do not use promoted listings if you do not know your numbers. If you know your numbers and you can afford promoted listings and you want to pay eBay for those sales, no problem. If you do not know your numbers, do not use promoted listings. Um, Figgy says, is it possible to increase promoted listings all at once? You could. You can go in there and you can... Um, you can either make a new campaign or you can adjust it. Yeah, absolutely. I lost my place in the chat, bouncing around. Okay. Eddie says, you can teach us how to sell, but that Riz you have is, isn't teachable. I appreciate that. I think you got to have a little bit of swagger when you're making deals at the flea market, at the garage sale. I think that really helps. I don't know if I got that swagger or got that sauce, but I do believe that that helps a lot. Um, what was the vintage site I mentioned? Someone, can someone type it in the chat, please? Vintage Fashion Guild. And right at the top, top left, it's going to say resources. Definitely study that. Definitely. Um, Figgy says, what are the newest calls in the group? What other calls are you creating? Um, the newest call in the group is a UK clothing sellers call. And shout out to young Jamie. Young Jamie put on a clinic last week for the first week. I mean, an absolute clinic. He talked all about soccer jerseys, or as they call them, football shirts. Um, a clinic. And if you have any questions about authenticity, what shirts to pick up, what brands to look for, Jamie put on a clinic. So that call is going to alternate between Jamie 
and Chica, and it's going to be men's and women's. And even though it's the UK clothing call, it translates directly to the United States. And I would highly recommend people checking out that call too. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, George says, do you clean caps that have sweaty sweatbands? People down here in Texas, what's your process? Yeah, so we clean every piece of clothing because that's eBay policy. Um, for hats, we put them into the washer, we put them into the dryer, and then we reshape them right after the dryer. If you let them sit in the washer, if you let them sit in the dryer, then they get all wonky. Some hats you can't save, and then some, some hats you really need to... Um, rehab and reshape so put them in a washer put them in a dryer get them out quick reshape them um beware of washing wool hats those will shrink um beware of washing red hats with white those will bleed so for those ones we um we hand clean with a toothbrush deborah said how do you get your rating higher i'm above standard um, to get your rating higher, you just have to meet or exceed all the top rated plus requirements. And another great resource on eBay, um, and it has everything. Read through this, the top rated, um, top rated and top rated plus seller program. Great, great, great resource. I read through it all the time still, and I've been on eBay for, you know, almost half my life. Um, but that is a great resource to go back and revisit and just refresh on. Um, are there any booksellers in the group? Absolutely. Right now, the media call is going on and um, it is a fantastic media call. I think it's it's got to be the best media call on the internet. I'm just going to say it. Um, there, there are sellers in there that do millions and millions of dollars who are in there helping people do their their very first Amazon FBA shipment or their very first listing on eBay. So like, there, there's, there's no egos. There's the best media call is right there. I mean, no doubt about it. And the media call is so strong that I checked with Jared who hosted it. And I said, Hey, I know you're doing the media call when I want to go live on YouTube. I mean, no disrespect, but I know I can go live on YouTube and the media call is still going to flourish. You're still going to hold it down because it's that good. And people aren't going to leave to come watch this, this, Ain't no breaking news if you're in the group. So um, the media call does great. And it's it's strong enough where I could do this and the media call is still great. Uh, I do get majority of my inventory from the bins and have solid sales, but so many people are against only sourcing from the bins. Is there something that I'm missing? I mean, you can source anywhere. You can source from the garbage. You can sell, source from the bins. It doesn't matter. As long as you're getting quality items where you can turn a profit, I don't care where you're sourcing. And nobody else should, and you're making money, so who cares what they think? Omar says, as a new seller, do we need to make an LLC? Um, technically speaking, you do not. You do not need an LLC to sell on eBay. You can sell on eBay as a sole proprietor. And all the money will go through your personal name, your social security, it will go into your bank account. And you could do that. You do not need to be incorporated. You do not need an LLC to be an eBay seller. Absolutely not. Very good. Thank you. What would you do if you have a lot of views and watchers per item, but no sale for 10 days on these items? Um... It wouldn't worry me the least. It would not worry me at all. Um, if you do get watchers, you can go into your um, your active tab on eBay. It has a bunch of gray, gray bubbles up there midway down the screen. And one of the bubbles is send offers eligible. I, I would send offers out to people that are watching the items, but I would not be worried one bit about an item that doesn't sell for 10 days. Absolutely not. Windy City said, what do I need to do to take over number one men's clothing seller? A lot. It wasn't easy, guys. So Annette said that eBay's AI description tool writes a description in a format that is deceptive. Yeah, I think so. Too. It's maybe not deceptive, but it's um it's a little too a little too fancy for my liking. Um, 
Do you get a ding for international shipping item that was denied and eBay kept the item? eBay is responsible for all of that. You'll get paid out. The customer will get paid out. Do you get any reduced traffic for removing items with watchers? I mean, technically speaking, yes, because you had a thousand items. You moved, you removed a hundred. Now you have traffic for 900. So like technically speaking, anytime you remove items, you will get less traffic. It's not like eBay is punishing you, but like um, I'll get messages from time to time that say, um, you know, I had, I had 3000 items in my store. I removed 2000 of them and like my traffic went to nothing. Makes perfect sense to me. You remove 66% of your store. You remove two thirds of your store. So since those items are not there, there's nowhere for them to send traffic to. So yes, technically speaking, the traffic will be reduced. Night Standard says, how would you structure a vintage clothing eBay store when you are in one state half the year and another state the rest of the year? Staging, sourcing, small store, high profit? Probably so. Probably something that I can take with me um, rather than like turning everything off. Cause like if you turn everything off for six months, you're going to have to redo everything when you come back, unless you had some sort of third party software that was saving your listings. Um, but yeah, I would have a, a, a small store as fast turnover as possible. And I would just take it on the road with me. I mean, it's not, I mean, in my opinion, it's not like the ideal situation, but you know, that's your life and you just have to, um, you have to make the best at it that you can. So yeah, I would probably do a smaller store, pack it up, take it on the road, and then get everything set up and set up shop again in the other six months. You got to do what you got to do, man. Besides t-shirts, what men's thrift section do you think is the lowest value on average? So this, this was my route when I went to the thrift, and this route can make you guys millions of dollars. Go into the thrift, hit the jackets, hit the sweaters, button-ups, polos, shirts, pants, shorts. Peruse the kids section for Patagonia North Face. Peruse the women's section for Patagonia North Face. Assess for stains. Check out. You do that, you can make a ton of money. The reason why I decided my route being that is because jackets, on average, is the most bang for the buck. You can get the most home runs in jackets. Um, sweaters, you know, sweaters sell 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks. And it's not unusual to find a sweater that fits into that bucket. Um, Button-ups, again, $25, $30, $40, even sometimes $50. Um, polo shirts, you're in the $20 to the $30 to the $40 range. T-shirts, it's pretty hard to source T-shirts nowadays as the price has risen. And, you know, a lot of, like, vintage guys go there and look for the vintage shirts. So really there, I'm just trying to get lucky and find something crazy that someone missed. Um, and then for me... My focus is not pants or shorts. That's why it's in that order. Um, but I look for pants, check out some shorts, even the swim trunks, polo swim trunks sell. That brand, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not that smart. The brand Villa Bricrum, that brand sells tremendous. Um, they make a lot of swim trunks. I always do great with them. Um, and then I peruse the kids section, you know, looking for some Patagonia fleeces, some North Face fleeces, um, some kids jerseys. And then I peruse the women's section because I'm not a women's clothing seller. Again, looking for Patagonia, looking for North Face, looking for stuff that's men's clothing adjacent, not blouses, not dresses, just men's clothing adjacent as far as sweaters and, and jackets go. So like there's no difference in my photo setup. There's no difference in really the product knowledge. It's just women's version of North Face Denali jacket. And I've always hit that route. It's done me good. And it kind of goes in the tiers of highest selling, most bang for the buck, best ROI in my personal experience. Um, Christina says, does the algorithm prefer centimeters or inch for jeans? I usually measure in centimeters, but wondered if it makes a difference. If you're in the United States, and I don't know if, where you're from, if you're in the United States, I would put inches. Um... Amber says, how many days did you source in the beginning? Sourcing is an all-day thing because I live in the boondocks. Sourcing, photographing, and listing all in the same day is hard. Um, I mean, 
I really have no idea what the beginning was. A lot of my beginning eBay life is a blur because I was all over the place and I was I was trying to raise a kid by myself and I was still a kid by myself at that time. I had a son very young. Um, I had I had my son when I was 18 years old and I was a single dad and I was trying the best that I could. Um, but it was probably a couple of days per week. I also didn't have a tremendous amount of knowledge. And I also didn't have a tremendous amount of money to be outsourcing every single day. So it was probably a couple times a week. And it was probably the store closest to my house, me trying to learn, figure it out. Um, I do remember getting a couple good, real good home runs in the beginning. Um, one of them in particular was a vintage Wilson authentic Dan Marino jersey um, that I bought for $5 and sold for $250. Um, that one really helped me out a lot back then. And those vintage Wilson authentic ones are crazy high quality. And you don't really see a lot of those anymore. Um, someone showed in the group a um, a Mark Brunel Jacksonville Jaguars one. Um, top quality, very nice. But I digress. So in the beginning, I was just trying my best, just like a lot of you guys are in the beginning. I didn't have a bunch of money. I didn't have a bunch of um, extra time. I didn't have a bunch of knowledge either. So I was just going when I could, where I could, trying to figure it out one piece at a time. Um, you know, if you do know that you do live in the boondocks or are going to have a long sourcing day, um, it's not a bad idea to build up a draft bank for those days. So if you list 10 a day, do 10 extra over the course of the week, you know, an extra five a day or six a day or 10 a day one day. Get that 10 in the draft bank, and that way when you have to go out and source and you spend the entire day sourcing, you don't have to do the photography and do the listing. You can just launch your 10 drafts, and then your eBay store will remain active. Yep, shout out to Isaiah for making that uh, spreadsheet. That spreadsheet is now in the document in the beginner section. And Robert and Isaiah, shout out to both of them. They do a great job in the beginner section. Robert's call today was on flat rate versus calculated. Great call, excellent call. Um, answers every single question one could have if you want to transition from calculated to flat rate because calculated can skew your results, calculated can overcharge your customer, and calculated can be putting off customers because it's showing them too high of a price than what it actually costs or a better method of you shipping it like a flat rate box. So Robert did a great call today on um, calculated shipping versus flat rate and how to make that transition. So between both of those guys, we have the beginners covered. Great, great, great calls. And we're very lucky to have those guys. Josh said, it's funny you said that you have an IT background and you got your A plus cert back in the day. Absolutely, I did. I did the same. I did I did M MCSE as well. Very good. Yeah. I did that. And what was the other one? I got I got these other ones. I forget. I forget. It'll it'll come to me. But you could tell that's how long ago it's been. I, I haven't touched a computer in, in a repair function or fashion in a very long time. Figgy says, is dry rot more common in certain areas of the U.S. than others? If you're talking shirts, um, no. If you're talking shoes, perhaps. Um, and for shoes, you want to do that dry rot test. You want to bend them. You want to twist them. And you want to make sure those aren't falling apart. For, for shirts, for vintage black shirts, black, the sulfur in the black dye eats at the cotton if the item is dead stock or if it is brand new. If it's been washed, then all of that dye, all of that sulfur comes out and the shirt is fine. It's only for items that are brand new, are dead stock, are black. Those ones become dry rot if they're from the 90s, even from the early 2000s. I had one from 2006. It was a Nickelback shirt. It was dead stock. And that one was dry rot too. So how you can test dry rot, you could take it on the collar. You can take it on the hem. You could take it on the bottom hem right here. And what you want to do is you want to separate it and take this right here. And you want to give it a little rip, a little tug, and see if it's going to break on you. And if it does break or does tear, then that shirt's going to be dry rot. Also, dry rot shirts, they kind of smell like maple syrup. And that is a good giveaway, too, to look for them. And I do have some dry rot shirts 
over there, but I don't know. I'll get those out another time and I'll do an experiment for you guys. And if you want to learn more about dry rot, um, Drew Heifetz, I did a podcast with him about five weeks ago. He's from F as in Frank. If you search his page on YouTube, F as in Frank, he has a dry rot tutorial, which is a great resource to watch. He also just made a great resource on Carhartt jackets where he went through all the styles and pay attention to all the keywords that he that he uses. And again, if you do not know a keyword, write it down, go to the Google machine, get a definition, get an image. He has a great, great video on Carhartt. He also has a great, great video on how to date and legit check Patagonia. Watch those three videos. Dry Rot, Carhartt, How to Date Patagonia. Patagonia has a tag on the side scene. It'll say S7. That means spring of 2007. It might even mean from 1997. And then you have to base it up on the tag. So you have to know what tag is from the 90s, what tag is from the 2000s, what tag is from the 80s, because it's just going to say F8. And that means fall. Fall of what? 88, 98, 2008. And these are all things that we have to know because that is going to determine big money sometimes. So Check out F as in Frank, those three videos. That's your homework for today. Dry rot video, the Carhartt video, and the Patagonia video. Every single time you do not know a term, pause it. Go to the Google machine. Get the definition. Look at the photo. Um, what would you recommend somebody that has a bad store? How can they liquidate bad inventory? So there is a couple ways that you could do it. Um, you can mark your items down. You can reassess the titles if there's better keywords to acquire the customer that's going to want it. Um, but we're, we're just going to assume that these are not good items and they're fully, totally optimized with great listings. You can mark them down. You can increase promoted listings. You can put them to auction, start them out at a price that you'll be happy with if they get one bid. Run it for a week, two weeks, if no action, you can go all the way down to 99 cents, go into the eBay fee calculator and make sure you're not gonna lose money on the item. If it goes for 99 cents and doesn't sell, you can take it off of eBay, you can have a garage sale, you can go to the flea market and set up once a quarter, once a year. The idea is to try to get as much as your original investment back to give yourself another opportunity, a better opportunity. We should be better sellers, better sourcers today where we can be able to get our original investment back and give ourselves a better opportunity. So try to turn a small profit. At best, try to break even at worst. So you can mark them down. You can increase promotions. You can put them on auction. You can put them on 99 cent auctions. You can have a garage sale. You can go to the flea market. If all of those don't work, then you got to take them behind the barn. Very good. Um, Don said they want to join the group. Even though they've been reselling, where do you suggest to start in watching the videos? Um, I would start with the, the beginning call. If you're a beginner, I would start with the morning call and I would start with the Tuesday night call that I do and then listen to any niche call that you do. So Michelle, she's in the chat now. She runs the women's clothing call. If you sell women's clothing calls, definitely tune into that one. If you sell shoes, Nina has a great shoe call. So I would do beginner call, my morning call, Tuesday night call that I do, and then any of the niche calls that you want to get into. Um, why do you prefer the rack inventory system over box number system? Um, both of them are great. However, the box system takes longer. And for me, I want to be optimized for speed. So the box number, the box system takes longer because you have to put everything into a bag. And a lot of those people use SKUs. So that right there is a complexity. The SKU is a complexity. You got to print all the labels. Um, you actually have to fold it, bag it, put it on the bag and then file them away. And then you also have to take items out of the box or slide the boxes where the rack system, you don't need a SKU. Um, and the condensing is just simply pushing it back. So I want to be optimized for speed because speed to me equals more sales, more money. And with more sales, more money, I could always get more space. So the racks take up a lot of space, um, but space is forgiven with speed. The box and bin system takes up less space, 
but then it does take a little bit longer. So I chose to optimize for speed with the idea of I could just get more space if need be because I'm selling more items. Very good. Thank you, guys. Great questions today. Um, where are we at? Chat jumped again. Trying my best, guys. Um, very good. All right, we're back. We're back in action. Yeah, I did a I did a Tuesday night till three a.m. the other week. Very good. Thank you, guys. How can I know the numbers or how to study them? A great place to start is by going to Google and typing in eBay sales calculator, typing in all of that stuff right there. And if you watch, again, the podcast that I did a couple of weeks ago called Techonomics, that one goes through a lot of it. So um, watch that podcast, follow along with me when I do the eBay sales calculator, and that'll hopefully help you understand the numbers a little bit better. And again, we do have the beginner call, which goes over nothing but the numbers. And then we also have Cheryl, who does the bookkeeping and accounting call, which, again, goes over all of the numbers. So those are highly, highly beneficial. Do most people list from computer or cell phone? That's from the Cleveland Flipper. What do you guys think? Do most people list from computer or cell phone? I can only say for me, I've never listed an item on the cell phone cell phone or by using the app. I'm a computer guy, but what are you guys? Are you guys computer or phone phone listers? Um, Jay Scott says, what's the difference between picking inventory for your brick and mortar versus picking inventory for eBay? Um, so wherever the customer is, that's where the item goes. So um, if it's a, this is the best example that I could make. A Harley Davidson shirt is very easy to find on eBay. Those go on eBay. A vintage Harley Davidson shirt from a 1986 South Carolina motorcycle rally, still very easy to find on eBay because people search Harley Davidson shirts. A vintage 1986 South Carolina motorcycle rally shirt is very, very difficult to find on eBay. Therefore, it's still a cool shirt that item would go to the brick and mortar store. So my um, my customer at the brick and mortar store is younger, probably under 30. It is also like two baseball throws away from a McDonald's and a high school. So all the kids walk past my store from the high school to McDonald's. So it, it's it's really the customer in there is under 30. That, that, that's like the peak demographic. Do older people come there? Absolutely. But like the peak demographic is, is 30 or under. Whereas eBay, I'm trying to sell something to that person's dad. So the brick and mortar store is for a younger demographic. eBay is an older demographic. So eBay is Tommy Bahama. I would never put a Tommy Bahama inside of the vintage store. Um, I still do put vintage on eBay just because I have a ton of it. But it just... Where is this customer? Is it on eBay? It goes over here. Is it on the brick and mortar store? It goes to this side. Or where can this item easily be found? On a rack, is that my best bet? Or try to find some keywords that somebody will actually search sometime in the next 10 years. And then I give it a go over there on, on eBay. But it's just based on demographic. Um, do you get extra insurance above the signature confirmation on it? if an item is going to the authenticator. Um, I do, because you have to protect it from going from you to the authenticator. So if you sold an item for $2,000 and it needs to be authenticated, I would get extra insurance just to cover me. Because if it gets lost before the authenticator, like you're on the hook for that. What is your thoughts on starting clothing at a fair price and dropping $1 per month all the way down? I mean, I don't know. So like if it's at $30 in a year from now, it's going to be at 18. I don't know. What I do know is like, you have to be careful about revising your items like every single day. Um, because they do take time to index. And if you are revising all the time, and I do get messages on Instagram about this, you know, I, 
I'm doing a one or a two day sale. How do you feel? Or like, I'm not getting good traffic. And it tells you right there on the markdown promotion, right before you click the button, it's right there. It's not hidden. It tells you that it can take up to 12 hours for the items to index in the sale. So you have to keep that in mind if you're going to do a bunch of markdowns in very quick succession um, without, you know, a lot of time in between. So like, obviously one month, there's going to be no effect, but like, if you're doing markdowns like every couple of days or every day, you might be doing more harm than good. So, you know, it does tell you right there on eBay that it can take up to 12 hours for the, the changes to take effect and for those items to enter the markdown sale. But I, I think that marking items down $1 per month, I don't know if that's really going to move the needle unless it's like very, very competitive, very, very price sensitive. And for a lot of clothing, $1 isn't going to like get people off the couch and rush over to the computer and then click on to buy your item. So I think I I, I think the the theory of that markdown strategy, maybe um maybe rethinking rethink it and try to use a different tool or or something, some other kind of way. But I don't know if one dollar per month is gonna do it. Um, Green Eye Moose said, what browser do you recommend for listing? I use Firefox. Never had a problem. I made five sales in the past week with 137 listings. Is that good? I don't know. Do you have 137 gold bars? If so, that would be horrible. Do you have 137, you know, pieces of media, books? Maybe that's pretty good, but... Um, there's a lot of unknowns to that. It all depends on what the items are and what you've priced them at and what the quality of the listing is. So um, really hard to say. Very good. Thank you, guys. All the great questions. Very good. Um, so what is your own personal me metrics for stuff you pick up at in the thrifting videos? All right, so my business has changed and evolved through the years. When I was listing 20 a day, it was a $20 profit with a 90-day sell-through. When I went to 30 a day, it was the same metric, 50 a day, same metric, all the way up to 120 a day. I was still able to locate $20 profits with a 90-day sell-through. Um, when the warehouse next to mine became available and my storage space doubled, I was going to increase my listing. So that was when I hired the first employee to essentially double what I did. And they were going to do 120 a day. I was going to do 120 a day. That's why I ended up at 250 per day. Um, and I know 120 and 120 doesn't add up to 250, but that's what I settled at because I could do an extra 10. No big deal. So that's why I went to 250 because 250 is better than 240. What kind of number is 240? So we do 250 a day. So the warehouse expansion to 250 a day, I had to come up with an extra 130 items per day, which is not easy to do. Um, also, during that same time, the big C came, and you can't say it on eBay, but the, or on YouTube, the big C came and everything shut down. All the thrift stores shut down, and we were supposed to have two weeks, flatten the curve, come back. Um, all the thrift stores closed, and as you guys know, they were closed for three, four, five, six months. So my, my sourcing strategy changed. And during that time where I exhausted all of my opportunities, I went to the end of the earth in my particular area looking for $20 items. So I had to decrease my acceptable range of items that I'm looking for. And my business eventually became a $15 profit with a six month sell through. So I still had the $20 profits in my store. I had a hundred of those every single day. But the remainder, that extra 130 items, those were lesser quality. So those were more of the $15 items, and those were going to be a longer sell-through. So my business evolved from $20 profit, 90-day sell-through, to $15 profit, six-month sell-through. And that's where my business was all the way up to the point where I had 53,000 items. So when you see me at the flea market, that's the business. It's six-month sell-through, $15 profit. But also, even though I do pick up maybe some items that do make me $10, we all forget about like the jacket that's going to sell for 100 or 
the shirt that's going to sell for 80 or the vintage shirt that's going to sell for 200 that I also show in the same episode. So it's on average. Everything we do is on average. So technically speaking, if you have a $20 profit, that means half of your items get sold for a $15 profit. Half of your items get sold for a $25 profit. And that's where you settle on a $20 profit. So half of them are going to sell for less. Half of them are going to sell for more. So if I pick up an item that's going to get me a $10 profit, I have assessed already that that's going to be a faster sell through. So if I'm going to make less profit, the sell through has to be quicker. If I'm going to make more profit, I don't have any problem holding on to it for longer. And that's where your average comes from. So if you have two items, one sells for $100 profit and one sells for $10 profit, that's $110. On average, between both of those items is $55 profit on average. So everything has worked on average. So when you see a couple lower end items, let's not forget about the jacket that sells for 30 or the jacket that sells for 40 or the jacket that sells for 50. And both of those, when they come together, will give you your average profit. We work on averages. So my current business model at 50,000 items when I had that was a six month sell through um, with a $15 profit. And again, I still had that eBay store inside of my store with the $20 profits, with the faster sell-through, but I also had, in addition to that, the $15 items with the longer sell-through. But I've done all iterations of it. I've done the $20 profit in 90 days all the way up to a longer sell-through just because my net for acceptability got more wider because I needed $250 a day, and I've exhausted all the really good items at $120 a day. I, I couldn't find 250 of those per day. So I had to make a concession. And since I had that extra warehouse open, I had an employee, we shut down all the thrifts for four months. That was the concession that I made. And the concession was, I need to lower my, my allowance, lower my profit per item, and I need to have a, a, a larger store. But by having a larger store and selling more items, even though the profit was $15, I made way more money selling $250, $15 profit items than I did selling 120 items a day at $200 profit. Very good. Thank you, guys. Oh, thanks, Noel, for putting those links in the chat. I appreciate it. So now we have no excuse not to go over there and check those out. Thank you, everyone, for all the questions. I appreciate it. We got the Super Bowl this weekend. I know I asked last week, who's winning the Super Bowl this weekend? I'm still going KC. There was a lot of San Francisco 49ers fans in the chat last time. Um, Quentin said, I noticed you mentioned using the draft bank to store listings in the future. I've been using scheduled listings. Is there a difference in the way these methods interact on eBay? Um, both of them will store your items. The draft bank, they say, is good for 75 days. So that lasts a little bit longer. Um, but both of those will, will store your items. Uh, chat bounced again on me. Unbelievable. Someone says, is it okay not to get a receipt at flea markets and garage sales? Um, that's pretty common. But just get a little notebook. Keep track of your... Uh, Keep track of your expenses. Keep track of the items that you bought. Keep track of, um, you know, everything that that you can, the best that you can. So what they're going to look for, the IRS, they just want to see your method. They want to see that you are keeping track and what your method is. They don't want to see just no method. Um, Wally says, when the thrifts are dry, what do you success for? What do you suggest for sourcing? Going further. Going further, going to more spots, learning more stuff. If you have the most knowledge and you have the most opportunities, you will win. Very good. Um, Bib says, do you consider seasonality when sourcing? If so, to what extent? I do not. Um, I sell swim trunks on Christmas and I sell jackets in July. So I would rather list and wait then wait and list. And I've had very good luck with that. And yeah, Noel is right. You just, 
You make your own receipts. You're not going to get a receipt from a flea market vendor. Jay Scott says, when you started to scale to raghouse sourcing, did you stop sourcing at the swap me and thrift routes? No, I did it all. I did thrift, um, flea market, and raghouse. I, I was never too big into garage sales just because, I don't know, it's a little bit spread out here. And I, I wasn't a huge fan of like driving 10 minutes and maybe they have nothing. I'd rather go to the flea market and there's 2,000 garage sales available. Look like a lot of phone people in the chat for listing. Computer listing, I'm on that team. Um, Tino said, I know your recent video show at the flea market. Are those are your preferred sourcing spots. Um, flea market or thrift. I mean, flea market's way more fun. I, I like to go to the flea market, um, not for the items, just, just to win. I, I, I like to win the flea market every single time that I go. Um, I don't care about the items. I, I do like interacting with the people. I do like the transactional aspect of it, but, um, it is work. So like, it's not like, I mean, I would prefer to like eat Doritos and play video games, but, um, I do like to go to the flea market and win the flea market where like a thrift route, um, especially the same thrift route, like every single week that gets a little bit mundane, but you know, that that's part of the game. That's what we signed up to do. Where the flea market, every every time you go is different. Sure, there'll be some same vendors, but there'll be a lot of other vendors, and you never know what you're going to find. And I, I like the transactional aspect of it. I like the people, um, but I, I I enjoy winning the flea market. And, um, you know, I really stopped going to my flea market after it shut down. So I wasn't going to the flea market for a couple of years. And, you know, now that my wife and I were, were taking vacations and, you know, we're going out and about. We are going to flea markets when we are out there. You know, our dedicated sourcing trips for YouTube videos for our educational content. Um, we are hitting some flea markets and it is fun. I, I do have a lot of fun. And like that moment where you get out of the car and you walk into the flea market. That's like. That's the best feeling in the world to me personally. I love getting out of the car. That moment from the car to you walking into the flea market, that's the best feeling in the world to me. How do you feel about buying bales? Have you ever done that yourself? I have done that myself. Um, I have never met a person who has been able to buy bales and have it be like great items. I've never met that person. If you are that person, hats off to you. I've never met them. Um, I've never met a person that buys bales online and is happy with the product. Never met that person. Um, the reason is, is that there's a lot of people who are at the rag house who are picking and the bales are usually the scraps. So is there probably a great reputable company out there? Sure. So like, I, I'm not saying don't do it or they're all bad. I'm not saying that. Is there a great reputable company that puts out all heat in the bales? Probably. Maybe I've never met the person who bought from them. So for me personally, I would rather hand pick, cherry pick, choose what I want, than be at the mercy of kind of a mystery box or a blind buy. I don't do gambles. I gamble with my life, not with my money. All right. Very good. Would you list items with minor blemishes and how would you price them? Absolutely. They're, those still do sell. Um, but they are going to take a little bit more time. They are going to take a little bit more time, but they do sell. All right, we got a lot of KC. We got a lot of 49ers. I think Kansas City, honestly, man. Very good. How does rag house sourcing work for you? So um, I when I did it, I had people um, that were sourcing for me going to the rag house. I wasn't buying from the rag house. I had people going there, doing the sourcing, getting first pick, and they were getting the best stuff. And um, that's where I was getting the best stuff from the rag house from.
Kiki's mom says she's trying out garage sales. Good luck this weekend. I hope you hit a home run. If you find something cool, please send it to me on, on Instagram. Very good. Storage Oxen Pirate in the chat. I bought $50,000 worth of vintage Grateful Dead concert shirts from him. Someone hit me up and said, oh, a, a guy that, that works for me, he hit me up and said, hey, this guy has a bunch of dead stock Grateful Dead shirts. He's in California. I said, all right, do the deal. Let me know how much. And um, Storage Oxen Pirate wanted $50,000. I've never met him in my life. Didn't even talk to him before that day. And I told him, all right, I'll send my guy out there. We sent him out there with a cashier check. He flew out. He was there for one day, did the deal with Star Jarks and Pirate, mailed them all back, sold them all. We both did very good on the deal. And Star Jarks and Pirate said he had harder deals at the flea markets for $5 than my $50,000 deal. So I, I took a lot of pride in that. And I sent him out there. I didn't hassle, didn't negotiate, didn't try to beat him up. I realized that it was a good price and flew the guy out there, packed them all up. He came back the next day. Everyone lived happily ever after. Shout out to Storage Ox and Pirate. Very good. Um, Jay Scott says, when you went to the rack house, did you pick by hand or pick by the pound? It was always picked by hand and we paid per item. Hats and caps unboxing. What is your opinion of the drop shipping business and drop shipping eBay sellers? Um, I would highly recommend you to go on the Google machine and see what eBay's policy is for drop shipping. And that would be my personal opinion. So if you are going to drop ship, please check out eBay's professional stance on drop shippers. Oh, man. I caught up with the chat. I caught up with the chat, everyone. I try to get every single question. I don't know if I did. If I missed it, I apologize. If I did miss it, send it to me on Instagram or post it below. But I believe I got just about everybody, and I have caught up to the bottom of the chat one hour and 12 minutes after start. So I'm going to take that as a W. I won this week, beat the chat. I appreciate everybody for hanging in there and being with me. As always, I don't need anything from you guys in the chat. I am just here to help. Love spending time with you. Um, love answering these questions. All I need is your attention and a commitment to be actionable. That's it. Just your attention when we're talking. I gave you a bunch of great links, gave you a bunch of great resources. You have to seek the knowledge. You have to seek the knowledge. You have to get better. So I gave everyone a bunch of resources. Check them out. They're in the chat. Noel did a great job with them. Um, Michelle did a great job with the resources. Shout out to those guys. Um, I appreciate you guys. Just, just give me your attention and then make a commitment to be actionable. That's it. So as always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot me a message on Instagram. I answer every single message on Instagram. If you have a question, feel free to post it below. And I answer every single question that's in the comments. If I never answer your question for whatever reason, it's because I did not get a notification. But I answer every single question. If you don't believe me, post a question in the bottom. Post a question on any one of my videos. Send me a message on Instagram. I answer every single question. Um, I appreciate everybody. Thank you, everyone, for checking out this video. This video is only good if you guys are good and have good questions. And I hope this helped. I hope it was helpful. And again, the best reselling hack of 2024 and for forever is waking up in the morning, getting dressed, and doing your work. Adios, amigos. Be great.